But the 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 younger people held back the police. It just showed uh, our humanity uh, that there was it there wasn't just. Uh, as the, as the uh, chief constable described us, uh, a gang of black hooligans. Uh, it, 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 it was people, you know, with, with black hooligans, they mean, they cares whether they're old, young, etc, etc. So that's a new kind of epitomised who the war was with at that, at, that, at that particular time. While that was happening, um, things kind of calmed down a bit, and then I remember the police front line, um, moved right back and so there was quite a gap between sort of like where the youths were and where the police were and at that moment i just saw a line a bright line come across the sky and something landed on the corner of catherine street i wandered over towards it and as i was moving towards it i didn't get a chance to get right on top of it so i make out the details of what it was but it was some sort of canister it just kind of like made a small poof, but a lot of smoke started coming from it. And at that point, I realised it was a smoke bomb. And suddenly the smoke caught me. And within a flash, my eyelids just started turning inside out. So that's how it felt. And my nose was just like running everywhere. There was tears streaming everywhere. And I remember the burning feeling, the burning sensation of like bleach getting, getting in your eyes or your nose or something. We could smell it even though we lived in Englefield because we lived directly behind Rialto. Um, and you could smell it in the air, I remember, you know, what, what, I won't say what, it, what his name, but he's a he's predominant young youth mentor, but really good man now in the area. I remember him running in our block, and we had a set of railings, which is the power station, so as you run in, you had to go that way or that way, and he run right into the railings, because you couldn't see where he was, he had gas in his eyes, you know what I mean? And smashed his head in on the railings, you know, we had to pick him and drag him into the house. It's a matter of record that the police were firing CS canisters directly into the bodies, um, of riot and youths. I so, saw um, somebody with their back blown out and somebody with the inside of their leg here blown out and there were actually 13 people shot with the canisters. I think the official figure was much less than that but I know there were 13 because we, because we dealt with them. If people don't understand these things, the thing to be made clear about using canisters like that was that they were supposed to be fired on solid ground or a solid wall so that they'd explode and let off the smoke which was supposed to disperse the crowd. But these things were being used like rubber bullets. We got in touch with um, somebody in the Daily Mirror and they told us that never on the mainland in Britain, except in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, had these um, types of CS gas canisters ever been fired. When finally they go the next day, especially where we live, because we live behind the Rialto. As soon as you come out, you had the delicatessen and all the shops at the front, they were all gone, they were destroyed. The bank on the corner, the Nat West Bank, that's right by where we, where we lived now, that was gone. <laughs> that was there, like, but it was a shell. The aftermath of it, the place really looked bad. I mean, there was no shops, there was only one or two shops. You know, you had maybe one or two little corner shops that were left, even some of the corner shops, our little corner shops, destroyed. Normally when you've seen like the toxic rights portrayed in the media, it's usually kind of like reported as like a single incident that happened over a number of days. But in actual fact, the riot itself was split into two separated events. Um, I remember that the first half of the riot was over three days in, in early July. And then there were a number of weeks, I think it was about two or three weeks, during which time Margaret Thatcher and William Whitewell came to the city. And then towards the end of the month, when I was arrested during the riots, um, that was the most damaging part. A lot of the youth were arrested, uh, a lot of the youth were in Risley, uh, a lot of the youth were going through, through the courts. So we had a meeting in the House and, and hence the Correct Defence Committee was formed. It just came from, from the people themselves. Well, we need to get these people out of jail. We need to get solicitors who are not friendly solicitors who can be going to, to you know, for assistance. We never didn't have any. Um, chairperson, he didn't have a treasure, there was no actual structure because everybody was a member of the Defence Committee. The place where people gathered was in the Charles Wheaton Centre. You know, they were letting us use their phones, it was a big ask on, you know, an, an organisation and they let us use their basement. I was asked to come in and, and trying to give some support to keep it, to keeping the Charles Wheaton um, organisation going. The Elliot defence were in there. The defence committee started to uh, find out exactly who had been arrested, where they were, liaised with the parents, 
uh, even went down and had a, had, had a demonstration outside the Risley, Risley Remand Centre. If you knew someone was arrested, you'd ring us and say, look, such a body's been arrested, I don't know what court they're in. And we'd go and sit in the court all day. We had court spotters and anyone could volunteer to be that. And all you did, you went in the court, took the name down, saw what they were thinking, if they were remanded, where they went to, what the next date in court was, who their solicitor was. And we did that to follow things up. To join the situation, it's not, it's not happening in a cocoon, it's not happening in a vacuum. There's, there's, um, if you look at the press at the time, there's, there's, there's uh, all kinds of press statements about that, about these savages and, and all, all the press was, is, is going on about um, uh, how bad people are. And we, we had our own press people team to actually try and rebalance that. There was clearly um, you know, a lot of discussion going on during the interim about you know, what had been coming out of the riots and some people including myself, weren't happy about what had been going on um, and subsequently the riots flared up again more violently and definitely more organised. It became more organised in the sense of people were able to, to clearly see that what the police tactics were. So it became organised in that sense. It was disorganised in another sense because while somebody maybe was uh, breaking into the tyre place in the Parliament Street to get tyres Somebody was on a JCB in, in, in Grove Street and somebody was a Hanson's Dairies. So were, it wasn't coordinated in the strict sense, but it was organised, if, if, if you could say disorganised organisation. I went through a number of experiences. Um, I was arrested. Um, I was arrested, I think it was the 27th or the 20th of July. And that was quite a violent affair. Um, everybody knew that you know, to be arrested was not the done thing. You got the beating of your life. And I got that, I suffered that, I had to, I, I could barely walk after my beating. Certainly when Parliament Street went up in flames, when Lodge Lane was looted, um, when Granby Street went on fire, I mean it really did dawn on you at that time that there was something really powerful going on. The vivid image of seeing kind of like Flames going high up into the sky in your own community, and the idea that you know we did this ourselves was a pretty powerful one. There was a looting going on, um, and people just had like a free for all in, in that regard, um, which you know, which I can't say it's good or bad. It's just one of those things that happen. Um, we had to fight lads off with um, mops and brushes in the in the laundress. They were trying to get in to loot, break the laundress up. Well, the laundress was a community. These were community things that didn't need to be smashed to pieces. It wasn't what it was about. I think one of the things that never leaves you is the extent to which people on both sides of the front line, police and youths, were determined to hurt each other. I remember seeing um, Jimmy Phillips um, in a van, uh, in a police van. Someone said, Jimmy, you got Jimmy Phillips in a police van. When I went there, his teeth were mashed, the blood was hanging out of his face. They, they, they mashed him, the police had mashed him. And of course, there's no question that the, the violence from the, the, the rioting was, was, was bad, but many throwing bricks and petrol bombs. Um, but the police, you know, the police killed somebody. The police killed somebody. A young lad um, who was totally innocent of any crime whatsoever, and he was subject to. Um, to death, basically, because he was killed. David Moore it was a young white man who was murdered the day after I was arrested, and I actually saw that happen. And I was on bail at the time, and I saw that happen. And I will never ever forget that. And nobody ever talks about David Moore, but he was a true casualty of what happened. And I think if there was a memorial to him, it would be the ideal sort of like way to reflect on what happened in terms of the violence because he was mowed down by a police vehicle. And I say mowed down, I saw it with my own eyes. And, you know, that's no exaggeration. He was mowed down by the police. So often the police van would re rev up and come chasing down, chasing people in, in the police van, in, in the Land Rovers. And one night he did this and again, young man had a, had a bad leg, he couldn't run as fast as anybody else. Police killed him. They was just riding round and aiming at the rioters to disperse them. But obviously with him being disabled, he couldn't get out the way. And it hit him and it dragged him. Subsequently, 
people were charged with death by dangerous driving, I, th I think the charge was, but obviously in the, the courts and the law, as it's seen, was um, they were found uh, pronounced not guilty. Another occasion, police violence, another, another guy was uh, the police cornered him against the wall and pinned him against the wall and then he broke his back. If you treat somebody like a human being, then they won't rise. If you give them the same opportunities as the white man next to them or the white woman next to them, then you don't feel that you are being oppressed in any way. So of course rights can be avoided because you treat people equally. Um, you treat them for who they are, what they are, the gifts, talents, knowledge that they have. You do not oppress them. As the riots finished, of course the government then started to, 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 to get involved and Margaret Thatcher came to Liverpool. We saw the town hall, I mean, you know, we, we were told the situation, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have it, she wouldn't, she wouldn't listen, she just was um, saying, you can't, no, people can't write, you can't do that. The council had tried to get Thatcher down for months and months and months. So it's it just what it goes to show the seriousness of what happened. She made it very clear that she wasn't going to do anything. She did actually then send up, um, her, make, created what was called the Minister for Merseyside, Michael Heseltine, um, and his secretary, um, a guy called Sorensen, actually spent several months in Liverpool. He thought that if you improve the physical environment, um, everything else would improve. He didn't address the essential issue was still uh, the relationship between the black youth in particular because of the likes of the sus laws and later the sas laws and the police. Recently we lost Father Austin Smith and at the time Michael Heseltine was drafted into Liverpool um, from uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, government to actually see um, the state of play because they'd stripped out a lot of resources to cities like Liverpool. And um, Michael Heseltine um, said um, to a meeting, um, uh, you won't get anywhere rioting, or no one will, no one will, 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 support, you know, will, will look at you if you're rioting, or come near you if you're rioting. And what Austin said to him, well, you're here. So obviously, they, it did force them out of London to come to Liverpool. People ask me about the riots, I always say to them that, I don't really know what the riot was about because I wasn't there. I didn't feel that anger or that rage when there's a thousand people standing beside you and there's you know a thousand policemen on the other side and I didn't actually experience that. For those people who did experience that, I can only presume it must have felt like one of these you know medieval war situations like Romans versus barbarians and the police are all there with the shields and people throwing whatever they're throwing, you know. But it must have been an intense experience. Toxteth, South End, that I remember the day I was arrested when I came out, that was no longer there. <clears throat> Obviously, it looked like a war, so. I lived in this community all my life and I watched this community break into pieces. Shops, businesses, I mean, what we look at now on the Liverpool is, is is just a slim shadow of what it was. Um, as a local businessman, had I been a local, local businessman 30 something years ago, I would have been devastated if my life's businesses had just been looted and um, you know, my livelihood was gone. I mean, when you look back at that, this is the crown shame, really, isn't it? Because, you know, everywhere got destroyed. Do you know what I mean? Um, which. To be quite honest with you, even if I reflect on it as 30 years, I, most of what was destroyed hasn't even been replaced. It was like waking up into a nightmare. So it, it, if you thought it was bad before, suddenly to come home and find yourself in the, the wreckage and the bomb down and the burnt happiness of it all, it was just like coming into a bigger nightmare. It left a lot of desolation, but uh, desolation. But the other thing, it gave spirit back to people to actually say is that um, the government had to take notice. Central government could no longer strip away the resources it had done and um, from that community. I think it just made me realise that you have to stand up against things that are wrong, no matter what. Um, and it gave me great admiration 
for my own community and my own, you know, who I am as a Liverpool born black because it took great, great courage. What it did do is again is it, it, it put Liverpool eight on on the map in regards to people knew then now that well we can't mess with them because they they are going to stand up for themselves and they are prepared to go to those lengths to defend themselves. Amongst my friends, there was a certain sense of yeah we've shown them and a certain sense of empowerment, which was obviously for us a good thing after you know years and years of being oppressed. But now with hindsight. I think I can say that, yeah, basically we smashed our own home up. And if you were to see, if you were to be at home and you saw your neighbours suddenly freak out and smash their own home up, you know that there was definitely something wrong in that home. We, we, we crossed them up, we were at the time. Her saying, you know, she's an older woman, do you know what I mean? Look what you've done. You know, she was like, you know, a big old woman. She, she just looked at it as it was disgraceful behaviour, you know what I mean? You know, people carried on like animals. Well, maybe we did, you know what I mean? That's, you know. But I could understand it from her generation looking at it, you know, look, just haven't done no good for yourselves. What have you end up doing? Destroying your own area. And she was completely right, you know. I mean, a lot of the elders were saying it at the time, do you know what I mean? A lot of us younger ones couldn't see it. But of course, you don't do it in rage, in anger. These are the things that happen. We took back power. We marched, and I think one of the marches against Ken Oxford, who was the chief constable at the time, and we would say one of the most racist police officers I've come across. Um, uh, what we galvanised was not just the black community, but people from all over the city marched against the oppression of the police with us. And so it actually started to um, reawake um, what was actually happening in our communities. Uh, so you had trade unionists, etc., marching with us. So politically, it, it woke us up to actually say, we don't have to put up with this. We do not have to stand for this police brutality, this police harassment. We will do something about it. This is um, a poem that I'd written uh, many years ago after the riots, and it, 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 it just says a few things and uh, make of it what you will. But here it goes, it's called Fury Across the Mersey. This is the place where the riots had been. This is the area where the media screened. This is the place the council decreed CPOs and Alison schemes. Yet this is the place power cultures deem. This is the place the riots had been. This was the place of the garden theme and placing toxic to the riot shields. And we were angry, young in our teens. The final showdown up a Parliament Street. So they called up the bishop and invited the queen. The pope and the prime minister all viewed the scene. Tarzan was invited, strawberries and cream. Then the fat cats and dignities all bowed to their scheme. Meanwhile, in Toxted, they landscaped in trees. Monkey business and employment promises, that's all it's been. Action Zone 8, where the riots have been. Thank you. <laughs>
I think that when we talk about race, we tend to focus on individual acts of prejudice, which is why UKIP often come up because they will overtly say stuff that we find offensive. But unfortunately, the issue of race, if we understand it, is a lot more insidious. And it takes a lot more of a historical view to understand the difference between individual bias and structural racism and privilege. And the idea of Great Britain was intimately tied to the fact that Britons invaded almost every country on the earth, literally. No, literally, there's a map, you can, you can Google it. And so the idea of our greatness was intimately tied to this idea of empire, which was intimately tied to what Rajard Kipling calls the white man's burden, to go and civilize all these stupid brown folks that have been writing and having civilizations for thousands of years, but let's forget all of that. And so if we fast forward to today, when we talk about structural racism in Britain, do we have the same institutional disparities in rates of imprisonment that they have in America? Yes, absolutely we do. Do we have the same disparities in terms of who's dying in police custody? Yes, indeed we do. In 2011, we were told we loved Libyans so much we wanted to bomb democracy into them. Five, less than five years later, we're leaving people fleeing the same conflict to drown in the sea while giving a woman space in a national newspaper to refer to them as cockroaches. Mm. And when you refer to humans as cockroaches, that is a mandate for murder. Let's be clear about that. The moment human beings become non-human, that is a mandate for murder, and there's a long historical parallel of that. Today, Germany, the country that bombed this country, you know, in our grandparents' lifetimes, so theoretically the grandchildren of Nazis, can get in and out of England easier than the grandchildren of people from the Commonwealth who fought against the Nazis. And where do they come from? When we talk about immigrants, do we mean people from Australia and New Zealand? Didn't Boris Johnson go to Australia and say, hey, we're culturally the same? Was he talking about the Aborigines when he said we, that? We call them expats. Right. White people them. have such a different way of classifying themselves that white immigrants are expats yeah. and non-white immigrants are immigrants. So when we say immigrants, if we go to border control, we can go there, Yarlswood, and we go and look at what, who's there. It's not a bunch of white people from New Zealand. Um, so we have structural forms of privilege and bias that are much more insidious and much more difficult to overcome. Um, the reaction to Africans and Asians coming here post-World War II, to rebuild the country after the Queen's German cousins bombed it, the reaction to them was one of general hatred. It's illogical. These people who had formerly been colonized by Britain had fought in both world wars. India gave 2.5 million volunteers, for those who don't know. When we talk about being saved by America in the war, we want to talk about being saved by India and Russia. That would be a bit more accurate. But that's a bit inconvenient. But the reaction to those people and their descendants has been one that is about structural bias and privilege. The greatest metaphor for this might be Canary Wharf and Tower Hamlets. Sure. If you look at that predominantly Bengali community that has to look at Canary Wharf every day. How many of those people work in Canary Wharf other than to clean toilets? I, I only got into that through Grime. So the first thing, I'm yeah. listening to Grime records and they're, they're all rapping about E14. Yeah. And I'm going, where's that? And I'm like, Canary Wharf? Yeah, they're What's definitely not rapping about Canary Wharf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose what I'm saying is not about saying that there is, there's bias and bigotry everywhere in the world. The country my grandparents come from, they, it's pretty much generally accepted that they don't like gay people. But what's interesting, race even plays a role in that. In Jamaica, we have disgraceful homophobia. No one ever says it's because of Christian fundamentalism. Because even though it is justified in explicitly Christian fundamentalist terms, because only Muslims do bad stuff because of their religion. Because we know almost all the Muslims in the world are brown. Whereas when a German wings pilot crashes and kills 150 people deliberately, or the man in Norway killed nearly 90 people. I was in Australia when that happened. This is how uniform the agreement is that white people will be portrayed differently. The Australian media referred to Andres Brevik as having terrorist-like tactics. Yeah. I mean, to think about that. Yeah. This guy killed almost 100 people, and he's just almost a terrorist. And he'd written a crazy thing about Muslims. No, it's yeah. very clear. I mean, he was a terrorist by, yeah. by any standard. The idea that white is right isn't just a European idea. It's an idea that has had insidious implications, because no matter what, the 700 people that were left to drown off the coast of the Mediterranean, were they white human beings, they wouldn't have been left to drown. And they certainly wouldn't be called cockroaches. Well,